Uh, welcome everyone to our first colloquium of this academic year. I'm, I'm really excited about the new format uh, for our 50th anniversary, celebrating the work of uh, talented alumni, uh, and in particular, alumni who are practicing outside of the Charlotte area. So it's, it's really exciting to see what the former students from UNC Charlotte School of Architecture are doing in their careers uh, at other ends of the nation and, and the globe. And I will hand this off to uh, Peter Wong. Peter and Katy Zhang have been doing a marvelous job of uh, curating this year's lecture series and uh, colloquium series. And so I really appreciate their, their efforts. They've got a very exciting lineup. Oh, I'm gonna stop sharing. <laughs> But you can see the, the website there, soa50.com, for more information. Uh, but thank you all for joining us, and I'll hand it off to Peter. Great. Um, uh, thank you, Blaine. Um, I guess also just to mention uh, and give people a little bit of, uh, of, a, of, a, of something to think about, but there also is a symposium <laughs> that we've been put in charge of um, hosting uh, come springtime. So that's another thing to kind of look forward to. Um, I'm not going to say too many things, but uh, um, uh, I'd like to say a few words about uh, Hunter Knight, who um, is joining us for the first colloquium for this 50th anniversary. Um, we have three more uh, scheduled. And so if you investigate the website that Blaine just showed you, um, uh, you can see and mark your calendars for these upcoming events. But we're really glad to um, have Hunter uh, virtually back to the school. <laughs> um, the Hunter is from North Carolina, he's from Mount Pleasant. And so uh, he's a homegrown um, architect. He attended our university and graduated with his BA in 2003. He then moved on and went to uh, received his master's degree in architecture at SciArc and received that in 2006. And since that time of graduating with this professional degree, he worked with um, Tom Main and uh, the Office Morphosis from 2006 to 2014 um, and was project designer and collaborator with the firm um, on a number of different uh, very important projects. Um, the Cornell Tech building uh, on Roosevelt Island, which was completed a few years ago, the Finance City Tower in Casablanca uh, project, and also the uh, Far Farre Tower in, in Paris, um, in which Hunter went to work in Paris uh, for, for a period during, during um, the development of that project. Um, since 2014, though, he had left Morphosis and uh, uh, opened his own office called Weather, Weather Projects Inc. And I'm sure he'll introduce us to some of the things that be, he's been doing um, over the last um, six years or so, almost six years. So um, we're really looking forward to seeing that. He's also taught as an, in, as an instructor at um, SciArc, as a visiting instructor, also Cal Poly Pomona as well as the Ecole uh, Speciale de Architecture in Paris, I guess when you were there in Paris. And that's a very interesting school started in 1865, a kind of rebuttal to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts artistic program. So um, very interesting. Um, I just wanted to uh, just say those few words. I did want to kind of have a brief anecdote. I don't know if Hunter remembers this, but when he was in our program, actually as a, as a freshman, um, he and I had a discussion about, um, you know, Corbusier's famous manifesto, um, you know, towards a new architecture, visiting architecture. And in that conversation, we were um, having a discussion about the, uh, the last section of the book where um, there's the famous uh, kind of saying says architecture or revolution revolution can be avoided. Um, and Hunter looked up at me and he, he was contemplating that, that, that final phrase. And he says, hmm, 
is uh, Corbusier saying that we can willfully and consciously reject a revolution, right? Being smart and conscious people. Um, but also is he not saying that in the case of architecture, there's not an option to avoid it, uh, that we have to confront architecture. I think, um, I don't know if Hunter remembers that, but I, I always thought that was very insightful, um, particularly for a freshman um, to, to, to take that reading upon Corbusier. So with that, let me um, introduce uh, Hunter Knight and go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much for the intro, Peter. Um, yeah, I, I, I do remember being really confused actually <laughs> about the manifesto. Uh, uh, I, I, I mean, there's, there's so much to talk about there, but um, there, was a, there was a lot I, I, I learned from you, Peter, uh, in, in various classes. I think I took your, I, I was in your studio, um, second semester freshman year. I was also in your Lowe's class. And then I was with you and Greg uh, in the Spain study abroad program and um, learned a lot from, from both of you. It was fantastic. Cool. Um, so it's a, real, it's a real honor to, to be here and be invited. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, I'm gonna get to it because I know we don't have a lot of time and I am concerned about <laughs> how much I've loaded up today. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start sharing my, my screen here. Uh, you know, let me know if something doesn't go right. So everything up? Cool. Um, so the lecture today is titled Out of Ideas, Out of Scale and Out of Practice. Um, and really, I think the, the idea of, of speaking about ideas came from the foundations, you know, learned it, uh, SOA and um, a, a lot of my transitioning from sort of a, a craft background um, into more of a conceptual training. And I'll, and I'll get into that in the first part of this lecture. The second part out of scale was is, is really to do a lot with um, going from sort of you know academia to, to, to building and understanding what scale meant and in this kind of buildings that I worked on uh, at Morphosis, which were large institutional projects and commercial towers. And then out of practice, um, all these obviously are a bit of a play on words, but um, out of practice really is, is about the things I've learned um, being in practice. Um, you know, and, and I, did, I did teach as Peter mentioned. And so there was always a kind of a cross pollination of ideas from, from teaching and academia. Um, but of the last you know, several years running my own shop, um, I've learned so much through practice. So I wanted to share that with you all. Um, so just to kind of go through um, the early days of where I started, my parents had a stained glass shop in, in Charlotte and they didn't do anything as glorious as this. This is Gerard Richter's um, uh, stained glass panels that he did for a church, which is more conceptual than anything I ever worked on. Um, but my early beginnings were really about craft. And you had an idea, you made a drawing, and then you, you made the thing. And you worked in glass, you worked in lead, and, and you, you built a window. And so any idea you had, there was, there was really just the process of making it. And, and that process didn't involve rigor, but there was no conceptual underpinnings behind it. My mother was a potter and, you know, both she and my dad had this studio together. Um, my dad did the windows and my, my mom did the pottery and I helped her in the studio, you know, sweeping the floors, <laughs> um, also making glazes, helping her fire things. But again, this was a craft that you worked directly in the medium. Um, so, you know, you may make a sketch, you may, you know, um, kind of toy around with, with some preliminary, you know, kind of almost like models, but ultimately you, you made a pot. Uh, it's pretty pretty one-to-one -one relationship. So when I found SOA, and to be honest, I stumbled into the school on accident, um, just kind of wandering around, um, I became fascinated with the things I saw there, models, drawings. It just seemed like something I would be really interested in pursuing. 
Um, and so when I applied and then was, was accepted, um, I was kind of faced with this. Um, it was a bit of a gridiron matchup with Hulk Hogan in terms of wrestling between what would be a kind of uh, craft making process, which is kind of what I saw architecture as in the beginning to a more conceptual approach. And you know the, the two hulks of, of that day were Peter and, and Greg. Um, you know, they really kind of taught me the foundations of conceptual rigor, uh, drawing rigor, and, and craft and how to sort of meld those things into uh, making uh, or, or pursuing architecture. And you know, they also introduced you know, projects and ideas. And, you know, as Peter mentioned, you know, precedents just such as, um, or, or, or readings such as like Rizier's um, uh, book he mentioned towards the new architecture. Um, and these were things we were really wrestling with literally and, and physically. Um, so I think for me, my struggle can really be summed up sort of in, in, in a quote from Robin Evans, I think my earliest struggles, um, uh, and this is paraphrasing, he says something to the effect of, you know, whether drawings should be considered works in their own right. Um, it comes from the recognition that architects, unlike any other artist, um, they do all their work in a media, which is different from the one in which the final work was realized. So, you know, that was my real struggle is, is I was, I was working in drawings that were getting at something um, that I wasn't actually ever able to create. Um, and that was something I really have been reconciling and trying to reconcile with for years. Um, so another, another piece of the SOA, um, or you know, Peter and Greg really introducing me to, to architecture, you know, we would talk about precedents and, and projects. Um, but I, we really, you really don't know what they mean until you visit them. So going with them to Santander and then Oporto and eventually, you know, seeing precedents of architecture, um, you know, this is one of Caesar's projects on the coast and seeing this project, living it firsthand, you really kind of, you kind of got it. You kind of understood the power of, of, of architecture and what it can mean. And so, you know, getting this sort of, this sort of dose of um, inspiration from visiting these projects, um, several of my classmates after the Santander program, we left and um, we visited a number of projects uh, and, and we kind of took a big European tour um, on the rail line. And one of our pilgrimages was to Brion Vega and, um, you know, anecdotally, Peter, um, this was a project that I that I I really I remember being really confused by and almost I think frustrated by hearing about Scarpa and almost like a kind of an ego. I thought he was being egotistical. I think I was arguing with you. Why would you have such a big ego about something? And and we were talking about the points in the floor, or you were you brought up that you you thought or or maybe you know that these points in the floor were references for the drawing and the construction of the drawing, the conceptual construction of the architecture, and, and ultimately kind of made as reference points in the final architecture. And I, I remember wrestling with that and just, just thinking, why would you ever do that? You know, that's it's just, that's ridiculous. How could you have such an ego to, to make a drawing of a, a, a building, you know? And, and then visiting it and going, oh, Okay, I got it. It's it's super powerful. And and seeing that, and then going back and thinking through Robin Evans now, the building and the architecture and the drawing, they become they become one. And and that was just really powerful again. And and you know, I I, I attribute it to what I what I learned from Peter and just thinking back through that lecture, being there, it's very powerful. Um so after leaving um Charlotte. I moved to LA and went to SciArc. Um, and at, at the time, you know, SciArc was full of a lot of like, um, you know, new, let's say Columbia, um, pe people that had graduated from Columbia had come to SciArc and all of them were touting, you know, Maya and Safdimaj and 
they worked in Eisman's offices or, you know, they were good friends with like Greg Lynn. So there was a, there's a lot of talk about morphology and topology. So I ended up working for a few of them. I worked for Marcelo Spina for a little while and we worked on this house uh, in Argentina. Um, it was a Maya project. You know, we, we did some models that ended up in the Biennale for this project. And it was just very, it was just very different. You know, the, the style of design was purely in 3D. We, we produced probably, you know, in comparison, really bad drawings, but we produced really beautiful, you know, Maya models and renderings. Um, but this was one of my first projects I worked with, with, with Marcelo. And, and then I ended up taking a studio with Hernan Diaz Alonso, who's now the director of SciArc. And um, we, we hit it off, we got, a, got along really well. Um, he's a really uh, interesting guy, um, very charismatic. And he was at the time uh, invited to um, uh, the PS1 competition for MoMA. Um, which is like a summer warm up series. And so I was helping him out with the competition, which he ended up winning. Um, so this is the early Maya model. Um, and so we went on to, to win the competition. And then we went on to sort of figure out how to build this thing because it was super wild. And, you know, it was quite a um, aggressive geometry. So a lot of it ended up becoming fab fabricated out of uh, fabric and conduit pipe. So we ended up um, speaking to Arup on how to build these kind of really curvaceous, you know, 3D curves, basically um, canopy structures. So in speaking with Arup, we came up with kind of a structural system that would be built up of these welded pipe systems that would then be sort of uh, fused together. And then one of my classmates who ended up uh, later going on to Gary Technologies, he wrote a script that would basically cut the pipes into um, just single serve segments, single curve segments. And then later they'd be sort of assembled into three dimensional curves and then kind of wrapped in fabric. So this is the final product, by the way, Hernan was obsessed with Maya so much so that we were trying to match the fabric to like the Fong material, <laughs> material colors and in, in Maya. Um, so it was really made to like look like a rendering, um, just kind of a funny, funny thing, but so this is it. Um, after leaving SciArc, um, you know, Tom Main actually was on my final review and saw my thesis, and um, and I ended up, you know, applying to his office. And um, and the first project I worked on was the uh, Tour Far Fair Tower, and it's in it's it's not in Paris because there's there's only one tower in in. Paris and Tour Montparnasse and everybody hates it. And actually that's not true. Um, Herzog Demeron is building this like pyramid tower, by the way, um, they started designing this tower before we started this project back in 2007. So it's just now, I think been cleared for permits and starting construction. Um, so that may be the second tower in Paris, but anyway, Tour Far is in La Defense. Um, so it's, it is on this sort of axes um, out of Paris, starting with the Louvre and the Arc de Triomphe, and then uh, um, uh, uh, ending in La Défense. So this is the site, which is kind of a, like a non-site. So you have this nervy shell building to your to your right over here. Um, this is from like the 1960s. It's a thin shell concrete building, which our client, developer client, owned. So you see it again there, um, the shell. That's the site, these two pieces of dirt here, here, and then this little patch uh, here. That's kind of where the tower sits. These were early kind of concepts for the tower, just tons of 3D prints. This is a fraction of what ended up being produced. This is kind of the final result. So you have um, a tower that's really made up of, uh, sorry, a couple different pieces. This is the um, sort of uh, entry point, this little pavilion. And then there's, these are escalators up. There's about a 90 second escalator ride. And then there's this little piece off to the side, which is the cafeteria. 
And then you can't see it in, in the site plan, but there's kind of trading floors that hook into this building. And the idea is really that this tower stitches into the Kinet, into their uh, into their property, and it kind of they kind of work off of each other. So this is the sort of entry sequence. And you would go up in the tower. So like I said, these are the sort of different components, main tower, commercial tower component, the trapeze, which was cafeteria, sort of ancillary services, mid-rise was all trading floors, and then the pavilion. Some context. So this is this is why this tower is quite unique. It's actually kind of a tripod scheme. So that the actual core does not completely come down to the building uh, ground floor. There's no parking. And so you have this main core here and here, and then you have these little pieces outside of it, which sort of act, these are basically in tension because the tower's so thin and long that these are now pulling against the ground. So as you stack up, you can kind of see now you're at the passerelle, which is a basically an elevated walkway that takes you to Leonardo da Vinci uh, uh, University this way. And then this is where the tower transfers. So these are, these are like 25 foot deep beams that carry the core above it. And then that's the actual core, this giant section of concrete here. And then here you see those escalators arriving at the atrium. And then this is the second level of the atrium. So the, the elevators are actually double stacks, meaning um, there's two elevator cabs per uh, um, core uh, uh, channel for the elevator. And that's the sort of atrium space, about 25 stories. And then it sort of stacks up in a more normative fashion. And by the way, the reason that we had this giant atrium was A, because our structure was out here, so we're trying to tie to it, but B, because um, the floor plate got so deep that we couldn't get natural light in. So we sort of had to cut it back and create this piece. And then these are all uh, braces back to the diagrid for wind load. Roof. And then this is in context from Paris. Grand Arch here, just off axes. There's the Parc de Triomphe. This wasn't built, by the way. CEO changed. I think I worked on this tower from 2007 to 2000. 2010 is, I think, the last year I worked on it. And then CEO changed, and the, and the tower tower died, unfortunately. That's looking towards, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci uh, University. So you can kind of grasp the scale of this thing. OK. Um, this was a project in Casablanca. They had closed the Amphit Airport, and it was now going to be dedicated to a sort of commercial zone. So uh, Tom had me on two competitions simultaneously, and then um, we only had four weeks to produce a scheme. So this was a really quick competition. I think OMA and, and Zaha's office was also involved. Um, and so we, we kind of cranked through this quickly. Um, it's a small tower. It's, a, it's um, I think, 25 stories. And so our early concept was because this is this this site uh, is located um, near a rail line and a big boulevard. The idea was that we wanted to have an architecturally um, uh, very active ground plane, and so the idea was to take the crown of something you know as precedent, say the Chrysler Building, and sort of rotate it and have just as much sort of architectural um, let's say, energy placed again at the base as you would the crown. 
So these are some early study models. You can see this sort of shape evolving. New work in the background. Site, site plan, you can see, you know, there's a boulevard here. There's a light rail line, another boulevard. And then these are low rise buildings around it. This is kind of how it stacks up. So you have a crown on the top. These are like the main lobby, main um, uh, uh, sort of boardroom floors. And then you have a more normative floor plate through the body of the, of the tower. And then again, it becomes more active uh, at the entrance level. And then you have about four levels of parking below. So towers, you can also think of towers as like basically a big cantilever structurally. And they're kind of, they're kind of dumb in that way. They're just a big cantilever piece. So what we did with this is we tied all the structure to the core. So all these angle pieces kind of have columns that basically tie into a giant piece of concrete that gets embedded in four levels of, of, uh, of parking. So this is the early concept for the Brissolet system, the main body of the tower here. So this is gonna be like a precast concrete piece and then just a typical curtain wall. And then up above, um, we were thinking of some kind of double curtain wall system that would have operable glazing um, with a photovoltaic frit. So this is um, just looking at the plans really quick. You know, we have parking stacks up really simply. And all of a sudden you have this very active uh, ground plane. This is an entry, a little bit of mechanical. There's the parking entrance here. Um, <clears throat> There's escalators up to the main lobby and uh, elevator access. And then these were kind of like cafeteria floors, meeting rooms, and then more normative floor plates as the tower stacks. Boardrooms at the top. So these are some of the conceptual renderings. That's the entry off the plaza. Brice wasn't really meant to be this shiny, but it kind of gave it a lightness that we that we liked. Interior, it's that second floor entry, boardroom at the top. There's our kind of big operable pieces. Crown. So this is it now. It's almost finished. A lot of construction going on in the Antha airport area. Looks like a rendering kind of, but it's totally it's a photograph. These lights, these light, these lights are a bit unfortunate, but um, you know, you kind of pick your battles. There's the crown. This is the last project I worked on. Um, or it's not the last one, but the last one I think that got built um, that I worked on for Morphosis. It's uh, Cornell Tech. Um, it's right off of Roosevelt uh, Island. It was the first building going in. This is the SOM. This is the original SOM master plan. Um, this is the revised master plan after we, we won the competition. And this is our sort of initial stab at the scheme. So there's our building here. This is all photovoltaics, kind of a big canopy. These are all placeholder buildings. I think. None of these have been built yet, I believe. This is the Louis Kahn Memorial. Um, quickly run through the plans. This building was interesting in that it wasn't a conventional, let's say like school, in the sense that it was really meant um, as a meeting place and a collaborative place for businesses to come and sort of test out new ideas. So um, there was no offices for the faculty. It was um, basically just lockers uh, and the, the the studios, or let's say the classrooms, were modeled after kind of the D, Stanford D School, Stanford Business School, to be highly flexible. So, basement was your lecture hall, more traditional. Um, the first level was a couple lecture halls, a, a big lecture hall, and then you start to see this sort of breakout spaces, and then these kind of almost open floor plan. Uh, um, uh, almost like business uh, or, 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 or open floor office plan kind of 
arrangement. So these are more like for breakout spaces for a few people to meet these smaller uh, rooms. And then these are the classrooms, cafeteria or the side. Uh, this is the main entrance. This is a kind of a lecture hall, but also it's a view on the 57th Street. That's that atrium piece again. And you'll notice there's a spine that goes down the length of the building. This is a triple height space and it was really meant to mimic what Cyrk does really well with its studios, which is the singular hallway where everybody sees everybody, everybody sees everybody's work. So there's an idea about creating cross pollination of ideas, chance encounters. That's really what this sort of, this sort of cut um, and open space was about. There it is again same sort of arrangement of open floor plan. And then a big photovoltaic roof. There was aspirations for this to be net zero. So we were looking at all different types of stuff like using the East River to kind of cool the building. Um, you know, I think they originally said to do net zero with the loads we had, we need we would need four football fields full of, full of photovoltaics. Um, we weren't even close with the amount we needed. So I'm not sure where they ended up with the count. Um, Cornell finished after I left, um, but I know there was a lot of ambition. These are early renderings. So you can see the East River there, proximity to Manhattan, across the river. There's that, there's that cut. This is the atrium that looks on the 57th Street. There's that uh, sort of um, hallway, triple height uh, area that I was speaking of earlier. That's the atrium. And this is it now. Okay, um, so what other projects um, started back in, you know, we kind of started in 2012, but uh, it was really kind of my wife and I just messing around with small renovation projects in New York. Um, we didn't really get off the ground until 2014, but, you know, this is the area of influence at Morphosis, um, you know, international projects, you know, big scale stuff. Um, you know, I, I was flying, I was traveling a lot, and, and I really saw architecture as sort of a global practice in that, you know, Buildings were destinations. Um, this is my area of influence now, or, or rather some, where some of my projects are located. It's hyper-local, right? Um, I'm in East LA, um, you know, my projects, some of my projects are, you know, the furthest, I think I have one in Marin, but most of them are in like West LA and Hollywood. So we kind of, you know, this is always changing, but these are some of our governing ideas and, things that we come up with. So right now, you know, what we're look, we're really trying to do is focus on making better spaces, places, buildings, and cities through a cultural resonance and um, which is super important environmental strategies, but not letting either one kind of override the other. Um, and we want to develop a body of work that revolves around dialogues between atmospheres, sensation, of course, weather, because, you know, that's our name. Um, and the work really aims to be more typological and less topological, more minimal, less maximal, and uh, leans primitive over complex. And last, really just, you know, it's uh, just resisting, you know, uh, any kind of ideological, uh, um, you know, lean. All right. So, you know, funny enough, we started weather and we were trying to do small projects because be honest, I was fairly burnt out on the large scale stuff. It was, you could never resolve anything. There were massive projects, massive timelines. And I wanted to work on something smaller, but we ended up with this 10 story hotel in downtown LA. Um, we were the third architect this client had hired. They were super connected with the art world and we couldn't say no. Commune was the interior designers and we thought this is a great opportunity, so we took it. We had a flimsy contract, <laughs> we probably didn't get paid enough, but it was a great opportunity. Um, but this is a, like I said, a 10 story hotel, which you see here. This is an existing like 
early 1900s, uh, unreinforced um, masonry building. Uh, that was like an SRO. The, the fire department was using it for practice runs. So it was in really, really bad shape. And then this glass cube was like an arc, uh, art incubator, meaning like artists could come here and stay and do installations. And then it would also serve as gallery. And then up top here is a pool deck with a couple, sorry, um, a pool deck with a couple penthouse suites. This is the entrance. So coming into that unreinforced masonry shell, um, these are bridges into that glass cube and then a canopy of, of structural members. Some of them are actually bracing that unreinforced masonry uh, facade. And then some of them are just kind of decorative lighting pieces. This is that pool deck, two penthouse suites up top, bar, and then your pool. So while we we're working on this project, um, like I said, they were entered, the, the clients were pretty, I don't know, um, active in the art world. So they, they had been speaking with Chris Cunningham, who's been dormant for several years, but he was working with Bjork on like a um, art installation piece for MoMA. So they were, they found this kind of industrial uh, space in downtown LA for him to sort of experiment, but they wanted to control, they gave him a bunch of money. So they wanted to be in the same space that his digital production studio was in. So we were trying to marry the two. <clears throat> and essentially we came up with a couple ideas. You know, this is sort of the idea behind the digital production studio is this open, flexible space that has green screens, you know, uh, different kinds of cameras and backdrops. Um, and then we were trying to come up with like an, uh, an open office floor plan that would reside next to it. So we started to come up with like a kind of a panelized floor system where you could plug and play various elements for, for this production studio and then sort of a sinuous uh, continuous desk surface that would kind of wrap this. So the sharp uh, um, shaped uh, figure ground is a digital production studio and the soft piece is the, is the office. This is our floor plan, which is, it's a super weird uh, existing building. Uh, we basically have studios that hug the outside of this. This is the digital production studio. Open office is next door. There's like a screen that we developed that would go along a rail where they could close us off. And then there's a, there's a private conference room back here. So these are the elements. This is the open, open floor plan for the office. That's the digital production studio. So simultaneously, you know, we're working on these kind of bigger scale projects. We're also getting our residential arms started and we're working on really small houses. So this is one of our first ground up houses. Um, it's an ADU in West Adams for <clears throat> some really good friends of ours. Um, and this was about a thousand square feet. We built it for $200,000, which by the way, may sound like a lot. I don't know uh, what Charlotte's construction prices look like, but that's really cheap in LA. So this is the ground floor. You have a big 10 foot tall sliding glass panel here, um, a triple slider here. And this is a porch. This is a big dog run. They had a bunch of dogs. They have four dogs. <laughs> so this is a big kind of yard for their dogs to play in. <clears throat> and then this was, was really meant just to open up on two sides so that you're really living indoor, outdoor. This is an old 1920s existing house that we were sort of connecting to. That's the second floor level. So this is all open here, loft bedroom, main bedroom roof plan, kind of see how it breaks out. This is, we had a rain screen uh, made of wood above a stucco base. So that's it. The owner, um, my friend, he owns a metal shop. And so he was able to fab <clears throat> these big sliders and some of these other elements. We, we kind of triaged the rain screen together and figured out the spacing um, and the alignments. And then he and a friend installed it. So I think that's part of why it came in just under 200,000. 
And the, the wife was amazing with landscape. She's such a, a good eye. And so she, she really handled these kind of garden spaces on the exterior. So you can see it's very compact. It's pretty rough too. We have exposed fasteners, you know, exposed hardware throughout. That's the second story loft. So he also did the stairs. And uh, apparently dogs really love our, our houses. Okay, so this is, a, this is another house, this is a renovation in um, the Hollywood Hills. This was a non-conforming envelope, meaning we could not touch the envelope at all. So everything that we did happened entirely inside the envelope. Um, it's non-conforming because it's a 4,000 square foot house envelope wise uh, on a 1,700 square foot lot. So I have no idea how this was approved in the first place, <clears throat> but my client bought it and wanted to know what we could do. So we, and another first thing to do was this, this original facade looks onto the Hollywood sign and the San Gabriel mountains, amazing view. It had like five windows in it. So we uh, installed a kind of grafted onto the, to the backside of the house, a moment frame. So we immediately opened up the facade. And then we also, another weird move is you walk in the original house and you couldn't see anything. Couldn't even see out to the hills. So it was also, what was weird is the, the floor height was like seven, six. So we dropped the floor a foot and a half. So you walk in on a nine foot and then, um, and then we opened up, like I said, this, this facade. That's the street. So there's a big retaining wall at the back, drops off about 15 feet. So there's like this little bridge to the carport. That's the main entry here. And then this is the, this is the sort of basement floor, the lounge space, little office, small bedroom, and then the stair stacks. And one thing we try to do with the stair is open it up to light. So there's skylights at the top of this that shed light all the way down to the basement. This is a little dashed void. So we're really trying to connect this very vertically oriented house uh, throughout with light and, and abilities to sort of hear what's going on in the different spaces. That's the top floor. You have two bedrooms, the master suite, ensuite bathroom, and then a view here from the Top. So this is how it ended up. Now you can see straight through the house. That's the Hollywood sign somewhere about there. That's the stair that continues up. We have skylights at the top, bringing light down. There's one of the little voids. And we also play around with smaller objects in the studio. These are 3D printed uh, dress numbers. Um, they got stolen, I think, after a week. <laughs> Somebody liked them, I guess. Um, this is a this is an all plywood birch screen, uh, Baltic birch screen with Baltic birch uh, stair treads. So that's kind of the interior. That's one of those voids up there, connecting kind of a little ancillary reading space with the living space below. It's the Baltic birch screen stair again, looking out onto the street. There's another void connecting down. And that's that view from the master uh, suite, Hollywood sign. There's a San Gabriel's, they're off in the distance. Um, this is a house we're working on currently in Bel Air. Um, it's under construction. It's about 7,000 square feet, also an existing home. Um, so it was a ranch style home, it was U-shaped. Uh, so we kind of maintained the footprint and then added a second story in a basement and a pool. And the roof is shaped such that it really shades against that south southwest uh, afternoon sun. And then we punctuated it with these kind of voids to allow light down to some of the spaces. Um, they also connect to these rain chains that bring uh, water into our, into our planter here to reclaim water during rains. This, this is a punctuated area here um, for kind of an atrium that connects to the master suite. In section, you can see that atrium space. There's a little sauna off to the side, basement, first floor, second floor where most of the bedrooms are contained. Basement, screening room, little playroom. This is a little, little uh, patio area, balcony. 
That's the main floor. So you walk in, this is the entrance, this is the street. Come in, park, walk in. This is double height, kitchen. And then this is the, this is one single bedroom here, living room here. That's the atrium space again. And then this is all pool deck, obviously. Second story, we have a bridge that connects across the two suites. Um, another bedroom, this is the master suite. And this long linear piece is the bathroom. And it also connects to that, to that kind of double height uh, outdoor garden. So this is the entrance. So you don't really see the door, it's concealed and then it's kind of layered with these cuts in the roof that allow light down to this uh, second story living room and garden. And then those are those rain chains again, feeding into this planter for water reclamation. That's the backyard. Master suite here, that's that uh, vertical atrium garden space. It's the entrance. So this is the Santa Monica Hills out here. Really trying to capture the view there. Kitchen, again, views out to the Santa Monica's. That's that atrium space off the master suite. It's our bathroom. Very private view. No one can see you from here, we hope. <laughs> we hope, but maybe you can if you're a hiker with some binoculars. But uh, this is the view of Santa Monica's here. That's the little clear story for peekaboo moments of the bamboo that's growing in there. These are some early construction photos. That's the kitchen area. There's that bridge. Lots, fortunately, lots of steel. First level going up. So this is more. This is more recent. This is a couple of weeks ago. So this is all. This is all going to come out pretty soon. It's just the platforms for getting the drywall in. That's a big sliding door. This is the bridge connecting the two wings. That's the front facade starting to shape up. We got our cuts in. You see how the lights now working. It's bouncing off that that window. It's pretty exciting. And then this is the backyard. Kind of a mess right now, but you can start to see the roof, how it's shaping up. This is a view from the pool. That's the master suite there. And that's the view. It's pretty epic. You, you get a view onto the Getty. That's Catalina way back there. Well, on a clear day, it's amazing. Um, this is another house we have in the, in the sort of Beverly Hills um, uh, hills. This is not too far. It's got a great view onto the stall house, uh, case number 22. Um, this is also an existing house. It was very difficult because um, it, it was all non-conforming. So we really couldn't touch anything, um, at least on this whole section, basically. Um, it was just the height. Basically, it was too high for the, for the zoning. <clears throat> so we added this little section of space we got the basement permitted and added a little balcony down here. And then we added this screen because the existing house was just, it was kind of a mess. It was all just jumbled up. Uh, it had gone through a couple renovations and was just not a cohesive uh, composition. So we really used the screen um, because we couldn't touch the massing to unify the, the project. It also allows for this transition between indoor and outdoor to happen in a more kind of soft way. And then the outdoor, you know, this is outdoor, by the way, here, this little balcony. So you have like views that get framed and this one has amazing views as well. Um, and then you get, you know, a shaded area outside your bedroom. This is the master suite, by the way. And then you get full shade or full sun here, depending on your mood. Um, this is kind of how it works. So we have a basement here, um, two stairs, skylight up top allow light to go all the way to the basement. Um, you have a bedroom in the back here. This is the master kind of floor. And then this space over here is kind of like a studio office loft area. Basement, first floor. And we have an axis that pulls all the way through the building, lines of the stair, lines of the pool, and then views of downtown LA come right off this. That's the top floor. This is a void here. You enter and you get a double height uh, space and then you go under compressed again. 
That's the office space, stair, master suite, master, master bath. So that's it from the street. This is the entrance. So that's kind of open the door and you look all the way to downtown LA. And then this is some recent construction. The site was an absolute mess, but it's slowly getting there. So the stall house is just there, through that window. And then on a, on a clear day, that's downtown LA. On a clear day, you can see the Catalina as well. Not only downtown LA. This is from the master balcony patio. Stall house right there. And then that's that void over the entry, skylight above. There's our stair connecting down. Our pool. A few views, pool deck, it's a screen, how it works compositionally. All right, so, you know, we worked on these like high end houses uh, for wealthy homeowners or, you know, developers uh, with a few few coins in their pocket. And meanwhile, you know, LA is going through a crisis. So we really wanted to put some of our effort and interest into how to, how to help, you know, the, the housing crisis. So, you know, the ADUs have been really kind of a, a welcomed uh, idea throughout LA. A lot, of, a lot of private, you know, homeowners want them, but they're complicated to get in, um, they're expensive. Um, a lot, there's a lot of prefab companies, but the prefab stuff is pretty difficult because you have to lift it over the house. There's access problems. You still need to build all the infrastructure, like foundations, run the electricity and water and power and, or uh, gas lines or whatever you're doing. So we really want to think of like a flat pack or some kind of way to, to help. So. I'm going to go through these two examples really quick because they kind of lead up to another idea that we we just submitted on to the city. So this is an ADU idea that we had, um, very compact, kind of a kit of parts, so to speak. Um, it's a really it's like 400 square foot ADU. Everything would be built in. Um, it'd be made of a, a metal uh, standing seam facade, um, wood frame construction. Um, on a on a uh, raised uh, foundation. So we really just wanted to kind of put in every element that we could possibly conceive of to really understand everything that would need to go in to this house. So we just try to draw everything and then walk through the sort of assembly process as if we were coming to the site with a kit of parts. So trying to really understand where we could innovate. So this is by no means like a solution. It's really trying to understand what we're dealing with. Um, so another study we did is looking at affordable building sites the city actually owned and they were looking to, to have developers buy. And we we're looking at ways in which we could think about these sites that could either be combined um, or they could be, um, bought by several people and maybe use a sort of incremental housing concept um, to build upon. So we started looking again at an ADU-like footprint, you know, like 200 to 400 square foot kind of unit, and maybe have knockout walls or maybe had, you know, flat pack, like what we we're looking at before, that could be configured in multiple ways. So we started looking kind of like a family of things, family of these kind of units. Um, so we thought, well, somebody could like maybe buy one of these parcels or go in on a parcel and put in like kind of a moving house, you know, a tiny house. Maybe that tiny house grows to, to a larger piece and they have like a roommate. They add on over time. Maybe they add on another one. Maybe they add on a duplex. Landscape. So this is kind of 
a stab at thinking through the incremental housing process that might be something you, you buy and then you, you really add on over time as you have more wealth or more people that would be interested. And really these are situated, they're low, they're obviously low rise, very low rise, single story, um, you know, abundance of, of landscaping, views on to trees. And, and it's really about, you know, the, the trick with, with this floor plan was to figure out ways to create privacy, um, but also have a sort of communal uh, uh, aim to the project. So this, this led us to our latest um, project, which was an entry into the mayor's um, uh, competition ran by Christopher Hawthorne, former, who's a former LA Times um, architecture critic. And he was like tapped to be the, to the, the design czar for LA. <clears throat> So you had a, a number of choices on this competition, um, varying from uh, unit makeup, unit size, um, or if you're gonna do like an adapter reuse. We chose um, a uh, 50 by 150 lot in LA, very typical, uh, to do um, uh, two, um, two uh, four bedroom units and two duplexes. So, six units in total uh, and so this this makeup that you see is kind of the, here's the four unit on either side and we have two kind of duplex units in between sorry my dogs are going crazy um so these uh these are arranged basically along a path so the path is here in the south, and you have this sort of zigzag pattern that allows for these balconies and these patios to emerge in the south. All of them have these kind of, these odd shaped uh, triangular pieces are, are wind catchers. Um, they also can serve as ways to exhaust hot air when the windows are open. So all the, all the units also are, are very thin, so we can allow for uh, cross ventilation, um, and, and again, a lot of stuff we were looking at in the previous uh, two examples apply here. So we were trying to think of like, you know, the, the four unit had a junior ADU that you could rent out um, or you could not enclose or you could not build it, or you could build it later. So you could infill it and then, you know, tenants could become landlords, so to speak. So a way to, to afford um, these through kind of a, an idea of social equity um, or socially constructed equity. Um, and then, you know, we're really looking at, at these uh, buildings through an idea of, you know, bringing in landscape, <clears throat> landscape lots of light, um, trying to make flexible spaces, <clears throat> flexible spaces um, that can be utilized, such as this middle one. Uh, it's basically like a, a, an area you could like rent out um, for maybe a home office, or you could rent out um, for parties or whatever, you, you know, kind of as, as things would be needed. Um, and then the construction, we're really trying to approach it through the lens of a circular economy. So there's a lot of like trying to embed a kind of a logic like we did with the ADU um, where these things could be disassembled once they're finally used and repurposed. Um, so lots of ambition, very short competition, um, but this is the elevation you can kind of see here. It's a site plan again. Um, so here's the wind catcher just above the stair. There's also a skylight that brings natural light into the, to the main core here. There's one of the bedrooms uh, here. Sorry, this is the, this is the wind catcher. Um, in plan, you have two parking spaces just off the kitchen. Uh, there's a living room here connected to the porch, and there's that social walkway uh, that connects all the properties, community garden. Here's that flex space I was mentioning earlier with the barbecue outside. And then for the duplex, oh, this is the junior ADU that has access from the exterior in a shared bathroom. So that could be the space you'd rent uh, to your friend or maybe family member. Um, and then for the second story, you have another balcony on the, on the northern side. Um, and then kind of a flexible 
uh, office space connected to this uh, kind of inner courtyard um, space with the stair is. And then um, for, the, for the facade, we're really looking at a precedent of, of the, uh, the, the Mexican fence post um, as, a, as a kind of precedent for how it creates micro shading. So the thought here would be that these folds actually create small bits of shading along the facade throughout the day to help keep it cool. And the facade is really just, it's a, it's a, it's a SIP panel system. Um, and we were talking to a few manufacturers about how that SIP would be potentially deconstructed after, after it was finally used. So that was kind of a early, early idea. And then you can kind of see how we're thinking about cross ventilation in this diagram. Um, there's that central kind of atrium space, uh, bringing air out, all solar up top. Solar also acts as shading for the, for the balconies. So we didn't win, but uh, we had a lot of fun going through this process, kind of just trying to get out ideas. So none of this stuff is cooked, obviously, but it's, it's just trying to put things on the table to understand. So these are a few renderings. That's that entrance off the street. This is that social kind of walkway. There's a community garden. Um, there's again, coming off the corner, a social walkway, lots of trees, trying to create you know, an atmosphere that has an abundance of, of light, shade, lots of places where people can socially interact. Um, all electric kitchen and appliances. Uh, it's just the way everything's going. And then that's that kind of atrium space connected to the stair. Okay, um, this is the last project I'm going to discuss today. It's one one of uh, probably the, one of the funnest projects I've done um, ever. This was for Virgin Orbit out in Long Beach, and um, and they were really interested in the idea of a departure from from old space. Old space being like NASA, where you had very expensive, um, uh, very expensive means to getting things into space. Also very sort of uh, stuffy environments. And I mean, to be honest, this looks really cool to me, like this kind of layout of a clean room. It's, it seems super interesting, but to them, you know, it's closed off, it's banal. These areas are really dry because it's a clean room, all the humidity is sucked out and everybody's in white suits and, it's just not a fun place to work. So, you know, the first thing we sort of approached this and said, okay, we're, this is old space. This is what it looks like and we're not doing it. So what is new space? So we started to find what new space was. So new space is interconnected. It's innovative. It's multi-layered, efficient, has new horizons. And for them, new space was democratic because they were allowing um, Virgin Orbit basically takes uh, satellites up to space, uh, but they take them up with several uh, satellites connecting to their rockets. So a big payload, big satellite pays the way for smaller satellites. So they had some that were the size of, let's say, large boulders um, and others the size of like a lunchbox. So the lunchbox guys were coming out of their garages. The Boulder guys are coming out of big corporations. So the idea is the LaunchBot guys kind of get a free ride in some ways, because typically to get anything into space was going to be six figures above. And so new space is going to be for everyone. And so for us, new space meant you know new spaces. So we started looking at their program distribution um, and we're trying to figure out what would be the functional relationships, You know, just diagramming out because it's very specific, it's highly technical. Clean rooms connect to airlocks. Airlocks connect to, you know, hallways where they need to degown. So there's a whole kind of process by which things needed to connect, just just purely functionally. But then we started looking at ways that things could have productive overlaps. You know, the ideas about diffuse boundaries, ideas about cross -pollin pollination ideas about chance encounters, all that started to factor in to what we were looking at. It's also having fun with this and it's Virgin and you know they're originally a music company. And so they're, they're really into hospitality. 
So part of this was like introducing a little bit of disco into this whole design thing. It was very serious, but it needed to be really fun and it needed to be high design and it needed to be a space where people would enjoy themselves. So we started off kind of with an understanding we were gonna phase things. They needed a temporary airlock and clean room and they needed a temporary or, or permanent uh, launch control center. So we started off with these two elements and the second phase would be to build kind of a second launch control center that's completely isolated and another clean room. Uh, this is an airlock here. And then this is a kind of a walkway connecting the entry, which is over here, through to the airlock. And then that airlock connects into this clean room. So this is the third and more ambitious portion. This is a circular clean room with a polar gantry, meaning it rotates instead of moves uh, X and Y. And then there's a lounge up top with a bar and the bar overlooks the mission control where you basically watch launches happen. And then the final component is this kind of um, high security zone. This is another clean room only reserved for like the Air Force and um, other agencies or mainly governmental agencies. And that needed to be kind of away from everything else. And it was gonna have a separate entrance and everything else. So starting with the sort of entry portion, um, we really wanted to, you know, kind of think about how you would introduce someone to Virgin and to the idea of space. So the idea you would come through a sort of normative lobby and then you would be immediately kind of turned upside down. So this is that sort of uh, normative so-called lobby. And then here where this, this gentleman standing is the entrance into of this, which is a sort of hallway that's uh, full of screens that are basically reeling data about current launches, former launches, and all the metrics that goes into a launch. Next is you would enter this kind of runway that bisects two clean rooms. And we're thinking that this, this runway would really serve as kind of a terrarium where, you know, you're in these really dry clean rooms and you'd be looking on to greenery. So the idea that you're mixing sort of environments that shouldn't be together, but also mixing environments that may be really pleasant. So you're in this dry, banal space, where you're able to look on something sort of pleasant and soft. So these are the two clean rooms. Uh, off to the left is the circular clean room with the polar gantry. And off to the right is typical gantry, typical clean room. This is it looking back towards the entry. So that, that kind of unique uh, hallway entry, the sort of upside down tunnel we were calling it is there. And then this is sort of as you pass through that hallway, that runway. So up top is the lounge looking down over this clean room. And now you kind of understand a little bit about how we're dealing sectionally with the lounge and the clean room below. So a big part of this also was selling new clients. So them being able to come in, tour the facility, see what's going on, or you know, people coming in and being able to watch firsthand, um, you know, rockets being assembled. So that's the lounge portion. This is also, this, so this is the lounge portion with the bar that overlooks the projection wall where you would watch um, current launches happening. So this, is, this area is really about just partying, just having a good time. You know, you've finished, you've, you've got your satellites packaged up and you're really, you're watching the countdown, the sequence. So again, you know, thinking about that space, really introducing a little bit of disco, maybe space disco ideas. So this is that, over that lounge space um, with the tiered seating and looking, looking onto the, to the launch area. This is it from the factory floor. So 
there, this one thing I didn't mention is all this is contained within an existing warehouse, about 40,000 square foot existing warehouse. So behind these people is actually where a lot of fabrication is happening. So everybody would kind of gather around and be able to watch these launches taking a place. And that's it in full effect. So off to the left, you have the launch uh, control area. There's our circular clean room with a lounge above. This is a little cafeteria in front of their branded wall. That's it. This is really great, uh, Hunter. Um, we're going to have to go to studio in about 18 minutes. So yeah, I'm, this is the last slide. So, um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the time. Really wonderful work. Very interesting. Um, can we just open it up to the audience? Uh, we still have a number of people here. Um, go ahead and turn on your mics. If you have a question for, for Hunter, I'd like to just make it a, a kind of, you know, casual discussion session as we head into studio here. Uh, hey, Hunter, I, I had a question. Uh, I'm Elliot, uh, I'm a master's student here. Um, I, you have like a lot of different experiences and a lot of different projects over like a lot of different scales. And uh, I'm kind of wondering about your kind of, you know, design, you know, like thinking or your design process of how you would, how you get into each of these projects. Like in the beginning, you showed a lot of like printed 3D models. Um, I'm just interested in how that kind of, how that kind of goes for you. Um, you know, that's a, really, that's a good question. Um, it, it depends, you know, a lot on, on the type of project, um, what we're trying to achieve um and and the and the client so like for for virgin for example um the client team was awesome there they were you know aeronautical or aerospace engineers and they're used to solving super complex problems like way more complex than architects come up with you know and and so what was what was really interesting about them is like before we even like sat down and tried to sketch anything we just tried to understand what they needed and what their ambition was, you know, and and after we kind of got all their feedback, um, we you know immediately started with just just sketches, just ideas about you know those functional relationships I showed you, just trying to understand the problem. So and that and that's really something I learned, you know, early on, you know, at, at UNCC, but also, you know, Tom really hammered this in to me too. Was like when we do these towers before we could do anything else, the parking had to work, the building needed to work. And so you work out those functional parts, you create a part T out of it. And from that, you would then move into massing and try to understand what could you sort of innovate on? Um, what was missing? And what areas could you sort of improve upon that were typical in a typological way um, that you maybe haven't seen before or could be could be re rethought. And so there's sort of like a conceptual brainstorming activity that happens, and that may include pulling precedence. That may include, um, you know, just being re really naive about what things you assume should be, should be, and kind of tossing that to the side and just going through a process of developing maybe abstract um, maybe abstract diagrams, you know, playing with figure ground, playing with void and solid, playing with, with shapes and seeing what that mashup of what you've like thought about as sort of the functional relationships and what you thought is sort of the abstract relationships, overlaying them. And again, trying to stay fluid because you're really just, you're really trying to stick jelly to the wall at that point. And I think early in my career, I was, uh, I was always, you know, this process is really anxiety riddled because you don't know what you're going to come up with. You don't know if you're going to solve it. And um, you don't know what's going, what the outcome is going to be. 
And so that anxiety still hits me even at the smallest scale projects. Um, but I would say I'm more comfortable with it. I have more patience just going through the process, knowing that it will lead to something. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Other questions, please. I think Greg has a question. Well, I, I'm just uh, just an observation. Well, I, my question is, what kind of car you're driving right now? Uh, if you've kind of uh, upgraded from the Honda Del Sol, um, <laughs> but no, I the observation is, I'm I'm just really struck by um, the the spectrum of of projects that you're working on. You know, the the kind of interesting kind of dialectic between the the houses for the well to do and your you know ex investigations into affordable kind of housing and um, it strikes me the the kind of compression of fitting the density that you're working to fit on those small 50 by 100 sites uh, that, that's going to lead to a kind of a sense of community that I would imagine to be quite remarkable um, and um, I'm also kind of struck in the as you described those three or four uh, house, houses for the well-to-do, how much they were kind of locked into their to their place, to their site. Um, I'm, 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 I'm like pleased to see the, the seize of payoff um, for you know, some of those site relationships. And um, I'm also kind of struck by the way in which you're describing the work experientially and the, the quality of section in just about all of the projects that you've shown. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, I, I peek in on kind of Peter's Corblos class periodically. And, you know, that's the thing that kind of whets my appetite is good section. Um, and it's also interesting to see in the Virgin project, um, you know, just like what you can do with a big hall. It's, it's kind of like, a, you know, a, a meditation on, a, you know, a Mies, you know, National Museum in Berlin or the, or Crown Hall, but with stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm just delighted to see the, the work. So that's not much of a question, but I, I am wondering if you kind of upgraded from the Honda Del Sol. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how this is going to, you know, be viewed by you, but maybe, maybe I think you'll, I think you'll like my, I don't know if it's an upgrade, because I think they're almost the same year. I have a 2001 Toyota Tacoma. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Do you still have your truck, Greg? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is a Toyota, so that's why I was thinking you might shame me. But um, no. But yeah. Nevertheless, it's still a truck. Um, I still, I still, Peter, I, I still want, you know, an an, an M M3, but. <laughs> They're expensive these days. Let's stop talking cars. You're exposing too much <laughs> to the current students that we don't want them to know about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Greg, thank you so much. No, I mean, you know, uh, that's, that's really coming from you. It means it means a lot, and um, so I really appreciate the kind words. Um, I think you know, <laughs> going back to Peter. Yeah, I mean, Mason de Vere. I mean, Peter had me draw that section. I don't know how many times. And I still didn't get it, you know, until I went there, and I was like, "Oh my God, this is this is really powerful." The, the way the way the section works and how it impacts the space, and so you know, a lot of a lot of that sort of sectional thinking was reinforced uh, amorphosis with the different types of atriums that link vertical spaces together, um, shower light on them, you know, and but you know, in my early projects, really. I, I try to shed a lot of the morphosis language, uh, which is really aggressive uh, geometry. It's 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 hard to get it. Um, it. It's hard to get it to get someone to pay for it. It's also for me these days. It's hard for me to sort of reconcile building that in the age that we're in. It seems excessive, um, and so really my focus now is 
how to get the most out of space um, with the least, you know, sort of impact. Not not like a minimalist, you know, by any means, but but you know, use a palette of materials that is that is not exotic. Um, and try to use space to give the most intrigue and uh, and um, interest to the architecture. Very cool, very 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 good uh, appropriate answer. We have a question in the chat from uh, Katie Katie Warren Katie Line Warren. Um, she says it's such a fascinating presentation, very compelling work. Um, my question is a little boring, but do you own uh, your own renders, like for example, do you do your own renders, and what software do you use? Thank you. Um, thanks, Katie. Uh, yeah, we well, okay, so uh, yes and no. Um, so a friend of mine that uh, we were colleagues at Morphosis started his own shop a few years ago, and he did the. Well, he did a couple of pieces for for us for like the hotel project that you saw it was the first project I showed the Chris Cunningham studio. He did those or his studio did those. And since then, we've been using Enscape, and it's super powerful. And I've I've tried not to make renderings also so uh, glossy, and just try to use them really as design tools. Um, in, in the studio. So there's, there's, there's also a danger to that, that I, that I would warn you against, which is things become real way too fast. And I think that's, that software package has real teeth for young designers. Um, but the rendering issue is sort of inevitable because, you know, clients want that. They want to see what they're going to get and they become part of the design process, whether you, you know, like it or not. But, um, but you know, long-winded answer. But yeah, we own we own a majority of our renderings um, that we do in the studio, and and we pop in and out of, uh, you know, using VR and stuff when we can in these in these spaces when we can't figure out something. Um, but again, I think you know, old school. Like I was drafting, you know, with Peter and. And Greg's studio, we were hand drafting stuff, and and I think there's something to be learned through drawing a line versus drafting a line, um, in that the pace at which you can create is a lot slower, and it makes you think, um, and that's sort of maybe that's my old school kind of like, you know, maybe that's just my old person coming out there, but uh, I can't draft anymore, you know. Because I don't have the I don't have the practice, but I also don't have the time. So all of this is like a time constraint issue. Um, you need to get the work out as quickly and as most efficiently as you can. Um, but I think that there's a real uh, issue with the speed at which uh, the work is made these days. I think the corollary question, you know, starting with your introduction of you know, why would Scarpa want to try to realize a little mark on his paper in the actual construction? How has that changed for you? I mean, coming back to that issue, how does that change for you now that you're using things like Enscape uh, or digital tools that are really all about the reality that might kind of flip that on its head? Have you, have you thought any more about that? Your tools uh, your representations actually becoming part of the built work, or has that been cast away? Uh, I I think the ambition is there. Um, the ambition is absolutely there, and and so you know you look at offices that are kind of playing tricks with you know like Moss for example, they're playing tricks with what's a synthetic thing and what's a real thing. And then the thing on site has like zero dimensionality. So for example, you would put a wallpaper that looks like marble on a surface, right? And, and so I think that there's, there's a lot of offices looking into, I think, ideas of creating this sort of digital record in the built environment of this sort of play, 
between the real and the virtual. That's conceptually really interesting. Um, for me, I don't play, I don't, I don't, I, I've been so involved in the practice <clears throat> that like, I really miss being able to uh, think about those things. I, I think like, like Greg had mentioned, these, these houses, they're so highly constrained. It's like, we just have a, we have a problem, you know? And like, the problem is like getting this house to work and, you know, making sure the client is satisfied. And by the time we put all of our resources and time into that, there's oftentimes, unfortunately, I feel like I'm always pressed to work on the design. And, and you know, the whole, the whole point of all this is to have good design, right? But good design makes up maybe a fraction, maybe 10% of the overall kind of uh, time that you spend on a project but it's gotta be the most important piece, right? Because otherwise you're not, you know, there's no reason to execute that. Yeah, Peter, I mean, I think like that is, I'm always thinking about uh, how to introduce, you know, architecture into a building and really trying to think through um, what, what all this really means, you know, I think, I think to create a building and to create a piece of architecture is, is almost, they're like two separate things, right? Um, sometimes they come together with like Brian Vega as a work of architecture, right? And, and I don't know, I don't know if I'm there yet. Um, so I, on the side, like I still like to practice drawing and more abstract kind of art that sometimes comes back into the projects. Sometimes it's just to like get away from the highly constrained uh, practice of things, just to have a little bit of freedom to, to have fun. And, and, and some of that's become like the affordable housing research. You know, it's a little bit of having fun. It's a little bit of playing with practical uh, building ideas. Um, and then, you know, using them as sort of re research vehicles. Great. Well, Hunter, to your original, your first slide, in addition to out of practice and ideas, we're now out of time, unfortunately, <laughs> but, which also relates to your point about using these tools because architects are often out of time given yeah. constraints now and client expectations. But this has been an incredible success. Um, I wanna thank you for sharing really thoughtful work, your career trajectory. Um, I love that that we as faculty and, and former colleagues can see what you've been up to, but also for our students to see that. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Um, and, and I love the reconnection, right, that you've been able to make. And, and so, uh, and let's, let's keep these conversations going, right? This is really inspiring. I wanna thank everyone for joining us and uh, Peter and Caddy for putting together uh, this great series and, Chris Jarrett, who's, who's plugged in here as well, wanted to say hi uh, for organizing the 50th anniversary events uh, and for Greer uh, for, for putting it all together. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll stay on for, for a few minutes. We can kind of reminisce, but I know folks have to get to get to studio, but thanks everyone for joining us and, and to you Hunter for a great presentation. <laughs>